Hello and welcome to the Christadelphians Present, part one of A Glimpse into Eternal Life. Eternal life in a world transformed. My name is Peter Wisnowski, and for the next half hour, I'll be your host as we explore together the Bible's wonderful message for the world tomorrow, a time to come in the not too distant future when mankind will experience the greatest change the world has ever seen, one that I prayerfully hope you will want to be a part of. With me in the studio today to help us through this journey of exploration is a longtime friend, our guest, Mr. Dale Crawford. He's come all the way from Nova Scotia to help us investigate Holy Scriptures exciting hope for mankind. Welcome, Dale. Thank you, Peter. Good seeing you again. You know, we have a very exciting topic today, and you know, the first question that most of us uh, have, really, the, in the grand scheme of things, is, you know, how does one attain eternal life? Well, a really good place to start with that, Peter, is a scripture that many people, most Christians, I would suggest, know all too well. And if, if we look at, at the slide that's above us, it's John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So that tells us right there that the goal, or the reward, if you will, is in fact eternal life. What is interesting is, is how many people that read their Bibles and that go to church would actually know about eternal life. What does the Bible say about it? What does eternal life consist of? And I suggest that although this is the goal of most Christians and many people, as you say, would like eternal life, very few actually know what to expect when eternal life is granted. Well, how is it that Christians who go to church that are, are you know, quite involved with uh, the congregation how is it that they don't know about these things? Haven't their, their ministers taught them? Well, perhaps they have. But again, if we turn to the Bible, we have a really good example in John chapter 3, verse 5, where a religious leader in, Jewish, in Jesus' day, Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee, he came to Jesus, and Jesus expected that this man would know and would be able mm -hmm. to teach and in fact, what happened in the biblical record is that Jesus taught him. And as our viewers can see, from John 3, verse 5, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus told him a number of things in this passage. He said that there is requirement. There's water baptism full immersion, there's spiritual baptism, and it's based on those things that one enters the kingdom of God. And another interesting thing about this is that Jesus is connecting eternal life with the kingdom of God. In other words, the kingdom of God is the structure, but what it consists of is eternal life. And Jesus actually had to teach this teacher of the law. So it happened in those days, and it can happen in our days. And I would suggest that the, that the answer to your question is turning to the Bible. That's where the answers are found. Well, you said something that would catch some people's eye in regards to something more practical than has probably ever been discovered, that you're saying the scriptures actually talk about a literal kingdom, a government actually being established and would still be in effect as we're still waiting for? Oh, definitely. It's, it's, it's certainly a future event. And as we go through the program, and even in the second part of our program today, we're going to talk about the kingdom as a future event. It's not something that existed in Jesus' day in the essence of what the prophets and what Jesus spoke of. It was certainly a future event. There's also another point that I wanted to bring up in, in terms of your initial question, and it was in terms of the understanding that was required and still today is required of believers, those who are seeking eternal life. When Jesus went on and continued talking to Nicodemus, he, he said something else that referred to his crucifixion. 
And that was something that the rulers of his day didn't understand. And this is taken, I'm just going to read it for our viewers. Okay. It's from John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. So it occurs after talking about baptism and just before him talking about truly, you know, about uh, his uh, God loving the world. And this is what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So what Jesus is telling him is something else that is required of all of us. And that is to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, but also to understand something about his death, how he died, his sacrificial death. And he refers to an event that, that occurred with yeah. Moses and the children of Israel in the Old Testament. So Jesus was going to be crucified. And that was important for the understanding in that day and for us today. These are things God is looking for in us to willingly want to learn in order to share an eternal life. They are requirements and conditions, I would say. So what you're saying is that the, the Jewish people, the people of the book, have always had this expectation of not only a coming Messiah, not only someone greater than Moses, but someone that would establish a divine earthly government upon this earth. They, they must have had something in mind that would even beg the question, where will this be centered? Where will be the capital city, right. as it were? Right. And, and I believe, you know, when we read our Old Testament, there doesn't seem to be a question in the mind of, of the Jewish people of that day in terms of what the prophets told them about what the kingdom would look like. They looked for a literal, physical, very real kingdom that would be established. And they looked for their Messiah to do that. And, and I, again, I want to look at another passage that tells us that right from the Old Testament, because these were things that Jesus endorsed. He didn't change them. He endorsed them. And so the next slide is from the Old, prophet, Old Testament prophet, excuse me, Daniel, chapter 2, verse 44. And what Daniel wrote was, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people, and it shall stand forever. So in other words, a literal kingdom is expected to be established, it will remain forever, but in order for that kingdom to be established, the current administration of things yes. in the world need to be removed. So there's going to be something that once it's established, it will never fade away like other empires of the past. No, I mean, the, the language is quite clear from the prophet. It will stand forever. It mm. will never be destroyed. So it is a physical kingdom. It's a literal kingdom. And, and a point that, that we really haven't made, and it's embedded in the passage, is that it's here on this earth. It's not somewhere else. So that's really important to note. It's something that the Jewish people looked for from their Old Testament, right? And it's something that Jesus and the apostles preached and endorsed that that kingdom would actually occur in the future, and it would be the Lord Jesus Christ that would bring it to pass. So it's not just for the Jewish people, but we're saying all people, Gentiles and Jew, both to enjoy this wonderful government. Well, that was the beauty of, of Jesus as the Messiah, because he preached first to the Jew, but then to the Gentile. And that's how the gospel message mm. spread. So it was opened. And as we read through our New Testament and into the letters, for example, that the Apostle Paul wrote, we see that that message was definitely opened up to the Gentiles. And many of the churches that were established in the first century were Gentile-based churches. Well, are, are there any verses that would relay this type of uh, gathering of all peoples coming to such a place? Very good question. We're gonna, we're, we'll look at that. And the next passage that we're going to look at is taken from Isaiah, another Old Testament prophet, Isaiah chapter 2. And what I'd like to do for the viewers is actually read Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4. On the screen, you'll just see a passage from, from verse 2. But this is what Isaiah wrote. He said, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow unto it. And many peoples 
shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So what we learn from this is that it involves all people. The time will come when Jerusalem, not the Jerusalem of today, mm -hmm. but a Jerusalem of the future, a new Jerusalem, will be established on this earth. It will be the capital city for the king, and all people will be affected by it, and they will learn the ways of the Lord. And, and, and there won't be war. It, it's an amazing time. Well, it, it sounds like, at least to some extent in some people, that they're actually willingly submissive to this worldwide ceasefire, which, which has never occurred ever in history. No, no and, and, and you know, we're talking about a, a number of phases that have to take place. Certainly, if, if it happened in the first century, when Jesus came on the scene, even though he was the expected, or the Messiah was expected, he was not wholeheartedly accepted. He was rejected and crucified. Mm -hmm. So a transition had to take place. And, and then the apostles went forward from there. We expect from what we read in our Bibles, primarily from the Old Testament, I would suggest, is that when the Messiah shows up, when Jesus returns and, and, and attempts to establish the kingdom, he will receive opposition. People, governments, rulers and powers were not willingly submit to him. This will be a foreign thing. And so it will be done in stages. He will have to subdue nations, like the prophet Daniel said, in order to establish a worldwide kingdom on this earth. Well, do you have a, I guess, a summary or some highlights of, of some of these changes that the Bible actually prophesies about will come? Definitely, definitely. We'll, we'll look at the next uh, slide here, and it, it's very telling. Again, it's from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah speaks a great deal about what the kingdom will look like in the future. So that's why, for our viewers' sake, You'll, we'll, we'll have a number of passages from Isaiah. Here in chapter 11 of Isaiah, verse 9, the prophet wrote, And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So the first thing that we've already talked about, the kingdom not being destroyed, but here, the knowledge of the Lord fills the earth. Can you imagine? I mean, that's, that's unimaginable today, that the earth, 7 billion people, with all their different thoughts, philosophies, religions, interests, would have the knowledge and willingly be obedient to one Lord, just like the waters cover the sea. Secondly, and just to, to summarize, as you've asked, we'll look at this slide, and, and we see that, that there's topographical changes to the earth. We see that Jerusalem, we've looked at, is the capital city of the world, which many people may find hard to believe. But the Bible is very clear on this point. There will be one divine law and one education system. People will need to learn. There is a transformation. There will be no more war. That's amazing. The earth will be full of the Lord's glory. The next bullet point says the desert will be transformed with the abundance of flora. What I want to do is, is look at Isaiah 35 for that because it's a beautiful passage and it shows us what the transformation looks like. Isaiah 35 verses 1 and 2 say this, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. So we see even mm. the deserts mm -hmm. are changed they're transformed. What was once dry and barren is now full. It's, it's an abundant, it's fruitful, it's joyful. Isaiah goes on in chapter 66, the last chapter of Isaiah, in verse 23, and he says this, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. So not only will all people have the knowledge of the Lord, all people will come to worship the Lord God. And we know the capital is Jerusalem. So 
Can you imagine a world where that has taken place? And that's what the Bible is telling. And that's what Jesus has, has spoken when he speaks about the kingdom of God and eternal life. It's a huge transformation. Well, just listening to some of the verses that are being explained, it's, it's apparent, I think, to everyone that there's going to be a parallel transformation as, as the world physically changes. There's actually going to be like a, a spiritual reformation that will all come about because there's a, a, a divine hand working through one particular man. And, and it seems that, as you're saying, Jesus Christ is integral to this transformation. Are, are there any verses that speak of his specific role in this future kingdom? There's a number, and, and, and it, it's hard just to pinpoint one, but I would like to, since we're dealing with the prophet Isaiah, mm -hmm. because it, it's important that the viewers understand that a lot of the information that Jesus and the apostles spoke actually came from the Old Testament scriptures. So we'll look at, at um, another passage from Isaiah, where he says in this, he says in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, he says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and of peace there shall be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So many Christians will be very familiar with this verse. It's talking about the child that will be born that we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. The government will be on his shoulders. It's using language that we're familiar with, not so much kingdoms, but he's talking about the government. He's saying that he will sit on the throne of David, which was a promise in the Old Testament. And when Jesus was born, it was told that he would be the one that would sit on David's throne. And that the essence of this kingdom would be righteousness and justice and peace forever. So that, in fact, is the role of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know from the New Testament that he was born king of the Jews and he died king of the Jews, yet he never took the throne. He didn't overthrow the Roman power. He didn't sit on David's throne. He didn't establish Jerusalem as the capital for world peace. So it certainly is a future event. It's what he will do when he comes back. So he will be king, and he will establish those parameters of a kingdom, just like was spoken in the Old Testament and endorsed in the New. So as much as the Lord Jesus Christ would be the only person historically who would ever have the right, who would ever be deserving of this type of role of, and not that there's ever been a, a king of the whole world, but in this future role, it seems that he's going to be fulfilling things, but this has as yet gone unfulfilled. We're still waiting. Absolutely, and that's why the return of Jesus is so important. It's something to look for, and it's something that we, who want to have eternal life and be part of this, need to prepare. I'd like to look at this next slide. It's taken, we're gonna go back to the Gospel of John, because Jesus says something that's really interesting and important, and I would say essential for us, in getting ready for this time of transformation. And in John chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus said, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. So when Jesus said this, he was talking about our role, why this life today is so important for us. He says, you know, we can labor for things that pass away, for food that perishes, but what we really need to do if we want to be pleasing to God mm -hmm. is labor for the things that endure to eternal life. Get ready, prepare yourself, understand what, are, what, we, what is required of us. And that really goes back to what Jesus said to Nicodemus where we started the show, right? Understand these things, know them, get ready, labor for the meat that endures, the things that are, are, are pleasing to God. 
And another passage, as, we, as he goes on in this discourse, is verse 40 of John chapter 6. He says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, there's a number of, of things that we could talk about in these verses, but I just want to highlight for the viewers that he's talking about the requirement to believe, to acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, recognize the work he has performed that was God's will that he, he do, that it's him that will give eternal life, but he will raise up people, raise them from the dead on the last day. So there's a connection to resurrection of the dead and a particular time, still future to us, when these things will begin to be affected. And, and these are things that Jesus is telling the disciples of his day and are essential for us to know today. Our life now is really essential for being prepared if we would like eternal life. So according to the verse uh, talking about the laboring for food, there is really a spiritual symbolism there that says God will supply all of our needs, but it is not the main be-all and end-all pursuit of our lives now that while we are in the process of a probation, as I'm getting, you're saying that this life is a testing ground for those believers that if they want to be part of this future, they have to look to things that are not visible and physical now, that are as yet invisible, to attain unto the things that will be a very tangible, physical future of this great joy to fill the whole earth. Yes, it, it, what, what Jesus is telling the, the people of his day and um, our day is that what we do in our life matters. God has given us things that we need in order to continue to exist, and he's expecting of us that we do something profitable unto him in order to prepare. So what we do, we, and he's given us the choice. We can choose to ignore it. We can choose to do something else. We can choose to live our lives and enjoy ourselves and just, you know, have fun and, and, and have a great time. But when the day comes, when the decisions are made in terms of eternal life, that's when, you know, it will be most important to us that whether we actually tried to please God in this life, find out what he wants from us, and then go and do it. The scriptures say not just to be a hearer of the word of the Bible, but to be a doer. That's what we need to do. We need to put our faith into action and, and actually uh, uh, become what we want to be in the future, living an eternal life. You, you've given us a, a fantastic uh, vision of the future to look forward to and in, in the few remaining minutes that we have. Do you have a, a summary of some of the highlights of what will come that we can look forward to? Sure, let's, let's just recap and, and we'll look at this, this last slide here, which kind of summarizes um, a huge topic which we've just mm. scratched the surface on and, and I hope that the viewers would, uh, you know, take the time to look up these passages in their entirety. We've just quoted verses, but look at the whole message around it because there's a whole context that we haven't had the time to look at. But if we just were to summarize, one of the, the, the first things we see is that the kingdom of God is a literal kingdom. It's a real kingdom. And we understand government and we understand what kingdoms and empires are like. That's what will happen on this earth. It will be literal. Jesus will establish that kingdom when he comes, when he returns. He will grant eternal life when he comes to those that he finds to be worthy and faithful. This will necessitate physical changes to the earth, huge transformation to this mm -hmm. earth. Get rid of the, the, all the things that have, have plagued this earth and that you know, people, very well-meaning people are trying to correct. Jesus will do that. Sin, pain, death, mourning, suffering, and ultimately death will be removed. That's amazing. Righteousness and peace will prevail. That will be the order of the day. All people will worship the Lord. 
it's, a, it's almost incomprehensible. It's hard to fathom when we look at, at, at the world that we live in. And the last one is that God promises this. He promises eternal life, the things that we've been talking about, to people that want to learn and want to know and want to serve. These are what are called the faithful people. So there are requirements that are placed on us, and it's incumbent upon us if we want to share in this eternal life to learn and then to do. And that's what we've been promised. Excellent. Dale, I'd like to thank you very much again for a glimpse into eternal life, and I'm sure we've all had an exciting journey through the Bible. However briefly, we're going to look forward to part two of A Transformed People and how we ourselves can enter into that glorious hope. Thanks for watching. See you next time. On behalf of the Christadelphians, God bless.